Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for A Dram of Outlander.com. Join me for in depth discussions of the Outlander book series by Diana Gabaldone, the television series, and anything interesting that falls between. This is podcast episode 145, week 30 of the Drums of Autumn read along. This episode is titled Fighting Words. Now, before I get started and go straight to the summary, I want to talk about some news that happened this week. One thing I know that people are very disappointed about is that Sam Hewen cannot go to the New Jersey Outlander convention that's planned, as well as Tobias Menzies cannot go. So that's pretty rough for the people who've already bought tickets and wanted to attend to see both of those men. There was also a season four teaser trailer released, and after that, Stars put up a shorter version of that video, and the final frame said that the U.S. air date premiere for season four is November 4th. Now, that video was taken down very quickly, so there's no evidence from Stars that that's the actual premiere date, but it makes sense that it's November 4th, looking at the rest of the month <laughs> and how many episodes there are. So I'm going to go with the fact that it's November 4th. They could change it. I doubt they'll change it. At some point, it will be showing up on Stars when it's going to be coming back out, so... That's pretty f- interesting. And some people won't even post on their groups that the premiere is November 4th. It wasn't a legit stars video. So, hmm, we'll go from there. You believe what you want. But that means, based on that date, that the Fiery Cross read along, it's a very fat book, will be starting the first Sunday of February which would be, what, February 3rd, it will take approximately 42 to 45 episodes to get through the entirety of Fiery Cross. But since there's been more than a year between seasons, I presume that season five will not premiere until January of 2020, is my guess. I know that sounds like a long time from now, but trust me, we're all going to blink and cough, and there it is, right? So, that will be coming up next. Drums of Autumn is taking about 36 episodes, and that's so it's not rushed, and we can really talk about the book. We're going to see what happens, but I'm pretty much thinking November 4th is the go date. But what did you think of the Season 4 trailer? We get to meet Angel Costa. We see Ulysses, I presume, standing next to her. We get to see River Run. Love it. We get to see Stephen Bonnet. Eee! But not really anything about Stephen Bonnet, just him and Flash. They were really skilled in showing this minute-plus video <laughs> without showing any detail or giving anything away. At least that anybody who read the books would know. Uh, Claire finds a skull with fillings in it. Oh, <gasps> Who could that be? Is that somebody that we've already met in this reading? Yes, it is. <laughs> we, let's see, see to see young Ian in action. There's lots of fighting, fires, a hanging going on. Jamie and Claire looking quite disheveled. We see standing stones. Not quite sure who's there at them. Somebody said she thinks it's Brianna, but it doesn't quite look like Brianna to me. So the very skilled editors being able to give us visual without telling us anything new. (laughs) Of course, they're so good at it. Anyway, I am really looking forward to season four. I love this book and it really piqued my interest to see. And I'm really was glad to see Claire's hair being very silver endowed, right? But 
I know we all can't wait to see what's going to happen with Brianna and Roger Mack and all of those things. And, oh, the other thing we saw in the trailer were the Mohawk or the Tuscarora. And that's very exciting because we know that because of visa issues and it's easier for those who are in countries who have been affiliated with the United Kingdom, such as Canada, that their First Nations tribes that are the same tribes, but they're just in a different location, are working on Outlander. So those are the people who stood in for the Tuscarora, the Mohawk, which are the Kenyan Kahaka. And it looks amazing. Like I just really look forward to seeing those relationships develop and seeing the dynamic of the between the f- first people and the white people coming in. So we do not have some of the people. We haven't seen them yet. And I know there's a few that we're all looking forward to. So, okay, that's that. If you want to leave feedback on the trailer, on anything else, what your thoughts are on the November 4th release, Contact at adramaoutlander.com or 719-425-9444 and leave a voicemail message. All right, so to the summary. In the summary goes something like this. Brianna susses out a truth about Lord John. She allows herself to feel close to Roger. She hatches a plan and proposes marriage to Lord John. She threatens him. She apologizes and explains. He explains why he cannot marry her. They become engaged, in air quotes. The priest prepares for death. Roger prays for him. The priest is taken from the tent. The drumming stops and all hell breaks loose. Roger escapes the tent but is knocked on the head. A familiar face is found in the longhouse. Claire and young Ian are missing. Inside the chapters. Chapter 59. Blackmail. Brianna wakes to relieve her bladder and notices the ominous thunderclouds. She worries about the weather in the mountains. Had her parents found Roger? Instead of going back to bed, Brianna dons her cloak. She finds it unacceptable to have a slave empty her chamber pot. She exits through the kitchen to rain striking her in the face. Brianna made it to the necessary, the privy, to empty the chamber pot and uses the rainwater to rinse it out. For a moment, she stands in the rain. She wasn't sure why she did it, but she purposely then stood under the rain gutter, allowing water to pour over her. Pain, pleasure, feeling alive. There's lots of reasons why Brianna could be doing this. Maybe she was trying to understand what her parents might be going through, being up in the mountains in this time of year when the weather is very poor. She notices a glimpse of light coming from the slave quarters. She does not want to explain herself or be seen. The lightning, however, shows her who was leaving the quarters. It was Lord John Gray. She runs after him to avoid being locked out. To his shock, she bounds through the door as he is closing it. She makes a comment and goes to her room. He doesn't follow. She slips back into bed naked after drying herself and leaving her clothing to dry in front of the fire. Her brain puzzles out what she saw and what she has experienced from Lord John. She hadn't felt the primal sexual acknowledgement she was accustomed to feeling. There was indifference. His sexual bell was chiming as he left the servants' quarters, though. There was no way her father knew and could be a friend to Lord John because of his past. For a fleeting moment, she could feel Roger about her, feeling aroused. Then the hands of Bonnet rose from memory. Anger and shame replaced arousal. Needing to move, she goes to the window and looks out into the rain. 
It was too late to go to Hispaniola and leave for the 20th century. Maybe if Roger was with her now, and they left to the island cave, but he was not there. Was Roger even alive? Her mother, she knew, would return before the birth. She does her best not to think of Jamie or Bonnet because rage swells when she does. So she's having all these things go on in her mind where she's fretful and concerned and thinks, no, they're all dead. They're never coming back. To Roger's alive. He's coming back. But her mom knew, just like she did truly, that it was too late when they left to go after Roger and to get to the Standing Stones. She would have had to have gone by herself and have left when they went to retrieve him or before in order to make it back safely. The inaction and helplessness of the situation bother her. She recognizes she decided to keep her baby and live with whatever consequences there would be. She's on the hearth rug warming herself. She thinks of Roger and disallows any thought of Bonnet to encroach. The only night with Roger fills her mind, evoking passion and arousal. The dark and secret places of him that she knew only by feel recalled a soft weight rolling and vulnerable in her palm, a complexity of curve and depth that yielded reluctantly to her probing fingertips. Oh, God, don't stop. But careful eye, oh... The strange, wrinkled silk that grew taut and smooth filled her hand rising, silent and incredible as the stalk of a night-blooming flower that opens as you watch. His gentleness as he touched her, Christ, I wish I could see your face to know how it is for you. Am I doing well by you? Is it good? Just here, tell me, Brie, talk to me. As she explored him, and then the moment when she had pushed him too far, her mouth on his nipple, she felt again the sudden amazing surge of power in him as he lost all sense of restraint and seized her, lifting her as though she weighed nothing, rolled her back against the straw and took her, half hesitating as he remembered the freshly riven flesh, then answering the demand of her nails in his back to come to her fiercely, forcing her past the fear of impalement into acceptance and welcome and finally into a frenzy that matched his own, rupturing the last membrane of reticence between them, joining them forever in a flood of sweat and musk and blood and semen. I read that because this is all that Brianna has. Her whole sexual history <laughs> is in that night with Roger except for being raped. She has to hold on to this. And... Bring him close to her. Keep him real for her. She allows the sensations to ebb before moving slowly to the bed, experiencing hot and cold together. The yin and yang, the doubt, the surety, all of those things are going through her mind. As she pulls the quilt over her bare body, she knows emotions must not lead. Decisions need to be made. For three days, she makes a plan. She needs to get him alone. She finds Lord John in the library reading Marcus Aurelius. Remember, a favorite of Jamie's. She asks him to walk with her. He agrees, though it is warm and cozy inside, it is quite cold outside. As they walk in the garden... She proposes he marry her. He kept smiling, evidently waiting for the punchline. I mean it, she said. The smile didn't altogether go away, but it altered. She wasn't sure whether he was dismayed at her gaucherie or just trying not to laugh, but she suspected the latter. I don't want any of your money, she assured him. I'll sign a paper saying so, and you don't need to live with me either, though it's probably a good idea for me to go to Virginia with you. At least for a little while. As for what I could do for you, she hesitated, knowing that hers was the weaker side of the bargain. I'm strong, but that doesn't mean much to you since you have servants. I'm a good manager, though. 
I can keep accounts, and I think I know how to run a farm. I do know how to build things. I can manage your property in Virginia while you are in England. And you have a young son, don't you? I'll look after him. I'd be a good mother to him. Lord John had stopped dead in the path during the speech. Now he leaned slowly back against the brick wall, casting his eyes up in a silent prayer for understanding. Dear God in heaven, he said, that I should live to hear an offer like that. Then he lowered his head and gave her a direct and piercing look. Are you out of your mind? No, she said with an attempt of keeping her own composure. It's a perfectly reasonable suggestion. He thinks she is out of her mind from the pregnancy and wants to call upon Dr. Fentiman. Brianna vehemently disagrees with the doctor coming and ups the ante. She drew herself up to her full height, put a hand on the wall and leaned toward him, deliberately looking down on him, menacing him with her sighs. No, you should not, she said in measured tones. Listen to me, Lord John. I'm not crazy. I'm not frivolous, and I don't mean it to be an inconvenience to you in any way. But I'm dead serious. The cold had reddened his fair skin, and there was a drop of moisture glistening on the tip of his nose. He wiped it in a fold of his cloak, eyeing her with something between interest and horror. At least he'd stopped laughing. She felt mildly sick, but she'd have to do it. She hoped it could be avoided, but there seemed no other way. If you don't agree to marry me, she said, I'll expose you. You'll do what? His usual mask of urbanity had disappeared, leaving puzzlement and the beginnings of wariness in its stead. She was wearing woolen mittens, but her fingers felt frozen. So she did everything else except the warm lump of her slumbering child. I know what you were doing the other night at the slave quarters. I'll tell everyone, my aunt, Mr. Campbell, the sheriff, I'll write letters. She said her lips feeling numb, even as she uttered the ridiculous threat to the governor and the governor of Virginia. They put Pederas in the pillory here. Mr. Campbell told me so. A frown drew his brows together. They were so fair that they scarcely showed against his skin. When he stood in strong light, they reminded her of Lizzie's. Stop. Looming over me, if you please. (laughs) Oh, Brianna, why are you doing such a thing? This shows her youngness and her desperation. Seriously. He forcefully takes her by the arm. She worries he might mean her harm. When they reach a private spot, he speaks to her. I'm halfway tempted to submit to your outrageous proposal, he said at last, the corner of his mouth twitching. Whether with fury or amusement, she couldn't tell. It would certainly please your aunt. It would outrage your mother. And it would teach you to play with fire, I do assure you. She caught a gleam in his eye that gave her a sudden surge of doubt about her conclusion as to his preferences. She drew back from him a bit. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. That you might... Men and women both, I mean? I was married he pointed out with some sarcasm. Yes, but I thought that was probably the same kind of thing I'm suggesting now. Just a formal arrangement, I mean. That's what made me think of it in the first place once I realized that you... She broke off with an impatient gesture. Are you telling me that you do like to go to bed with women? He raised one eyebrow. Well... Would that make a substantial difference to your plans? Well, she said uncertainly, yes. Yes, it would. If I'd known that, I wouldn't have suggested it. Suggested, she says, he muttered. Public denunciation, the pillory. Suggested. 
The blood burned so hotly in her cheeks, she was surprised not to see the cold air turn to steam around her face. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. She flushes and apologizes, assuring him that she would not have said anything to anyone if he turned her down. She further explains, and they discuss the ins and outs of her plan. If you did want to sleep with me, I couldn't marry you. It wouldn't be right. He closed his eyes very tight and held them squinched shut for a minute. Then he opened one light blue eye and looked at her. Why not? he asked. Because of Roger, she said, and was infuriated to hear her voice break on the name, still more infuriated to feel a hot tear escape to run down her cheek. Damn it! Damn it to hell! I wasn't even going to think about him. She swiped the tear angrily away and clenched her teeth. Maybe you're right. Maybe it is being pregnant. I cry all the time over nothing. I rather doubt it is nothing, he said dryly. She took a deep breath, the cold air hollowing her chest. There was one last card to play then. If you do like women, I couldn't, I mean... I don't want to sleep with you regularly, and I wouldn't mind you sleeping with anybody else, male or female. Thank you for that, he muttered, but she ignored him, bent only on the need to get it all out. But I can see that you might want a child of your own. It wouldn't be right for me to keep you from having one. I can give you that, I think. She glanced down at herself, arms clasped across the round of her belly. Everyone says I'm made for childbearing. She went unsteadily, eyes on her feet. I'd... Just until I got pregnant again, though. You'd have to put that in the contract, too. Mr. Campbell could draw it up. Lauren John massaged his forehead, evidently suffering the onslaught of a massive headache. Then he dropped his hand and took her by the arm. Come and sit down, child. You best tell me what the devil you're up to. She took a deep, savage breath to steady her voice. I am not a child. He glanced up at her and seemed to change his mind about something. No, you're not. God help us both. But before you startle Fawcett Campbell into an apoplexy with your notion of a suitable marriage contract, I beg you to sit with me for a moment and share the processes of your most remarkable brain. He motioned her through the archway into the ornamental garden, where they would be invisible from the house. The garden was bleak but orderly. All the dead stalks of the year before had been pulled out, the dry stems chopped and scattered as mulch over the beds. Only in the circular bed around the dry fountain were the signs of life. Green crocus spikes poked up like tiny battering rams, vivid and intransigent. They sat but she couldn't sit, not and face him. He got up with her and walked beside her, not touching her but keeping pace, the wind whipping strands of blonde hair across his face, not saying a word but listening, listening as she told him almost everything. So, I've been thinking and thinking, she ended wretchedly, and I never get anywhere. Do you see? Mother and... and Da... They're out there somewhere, she waved an arm toward the distant mountains. Anything could happen to them. Anything might have happened to Roger already. And here I sit, getting bigger and bigger, and there's nothing I can do. She glanced down at him and drew the back of a mittened hand under her dripping nose. I'm not crying, she assured him, though she was. Of course not, he said. He took her hand and drew it through his arm. Round and round, he murmured, eyes on the path of crazy paving as they circled the fountain. Yes, round and round the mulberry bush. And I'll be pop goes the weasel in three months or so. I have to do something, she ended miserably. Believe it or not, in your case, waiting is doing something. Though, I admit, it may not seem so. Why is that you will not wait to see whether your father's quest is successful? Is it that your sense of honor will not allow you to bear a fatherless child, or... 
It's not my honor, she said. It's Roger's. It's his. Roger's. He's, he followed me. He gave up everything and came after me when I came here to find my father. I knew he would, and he did. When he finds out about this, she grimaced, cupping a hand to the swell of her stomach, he'll marry me. He'll feel as though he has to, and I can't let him do that. Why not? Because I love him. I don't want him to marry me out of obligation, and I... She clamped her lips tight on the rest of it. I won't. I've made up my mind, and I won't. Lord John pulled his cloak tighter as a blast of wind came rocketing in off the river. It smelled of ice and dead leaves, but there was a hint of freshness in it. Spring was coming. I see. Well, I quite agree with your aunt that you require a husband. Why me, though? He raised one pale brow. Is it my title or my wealth? Neither one. It was because I was sure that you didn't like women, she said, giving him one of those candid blue looks. I do like women, he said, exasperated. I admire and honor them, and for several of the sex, I feel considerable affection. Your mother among them. Though I doubt the sentiment is reciprocated. I do not, however, seek pleasure in their beds. Do I speak plainly enough? He did speak plainly enough. Lord John explained why he cannot marry her. To name only the most obvious, your father would undoubtedly break my neck. What for? she demanded, frowning. He likes you. He says you're one of his best friends. I'm honored to be the recipient of his esteem. However, that esteem would very shortly cease to exist upon Jamie Fraser's discovering that his daughter was serving as a consort and broodmare to a degenerate sodomite. And how would he discover that, she demanded. I wouldn't tell him. Then she flushed, and meeting his outraged eye suddenly dissolved into laughter, in which he helplessly joined. Well, I'm sorry, but you said it. She gasped at last, sitting up and wiping her streaming eyes with the hem of her cloak. Oh, Christ. Yes, I did. Distracted, he thumbed a strand of hair out of his mouth and wiped his running nose on his sleeve again. Damn, why haven't I a handkerchief? I said it because it's true. As your father finding out, he's well aware of the fact. He is? She seemed disproportionately surprised. But I thought he'd never. And at that, they were interrupted. <laughs> Brianna is shocked to learn her father knows of Lord John's sexual persuasion. They find a more sheltered spot to talk. He sneezes, and she hands him a handkerchief. He thinks it smells surprisingly of girl flesh. <laughs> Those words just made me laugh. She asks what he meant about teaching her to play with fire. Jess, what did you mean by that? Nothing, he said. But now it was his turn to flush. Nothing, hmm? She said and gave him the ghost of an ironic smile. That was a threat if I ever heard one. He sighed and wiped his face once more with her handkerchief. You have been frank with me, to the point of embarrassment and well beyond. So yes, I suppose I... No, it was a threat. You look like your father, don't you see? She frowned at him, his words obviously meaning nothing. Then realization flickered, sprang to full life. She sat bolt upright, staring down at him. Not you, not da, he wouldn't. No, said Lord John very dryly, he wouldn't. Though your shock is scarcely flattering, and for what the statement is worth, I would under no circumstance take advantage of your likeness to him. That was as much an idle threat as was your menacing me with exposure. Where did you meet my father? She asked carefully, her own trouble superseded for the moment by curiosity. In prison. You know he was imprisoned after the rising. She nodded, frowning slightly. 
Yes. Well, leave it as said that I harbor feelings of particular affection for Jamie Fraser and have for some years. He shook his head, sighing. And here you come, offering me your innocent body with its echoes of his flesh, and add to that the promise of giving me a child who would mingle my blood with his, and all this because your honor would not let you wed a man you love or love a man you wed. He broke off and sank his head in his hands. Child, you would make an angel weep, and God knows I am no angel. My mother thinks you are. He glanced up at her, startled. She thinks what? Maybe she wouldn't go quite that far, she amended, still frowning. She says you're a good man, though. I think she likes you, but she doesn't want to. Of course, I understand that now, I suppose. She must know how you uh, feel about. She coughed, hiding her blushes in a fold of her cloak. Hell. Oh, hell hell and thundering damnation. I ought never to have come out with you. Yes, she does. Though in all truth, I'm not sure why she regards me with suspicion. It cannot be jealousy, surely. Brianna tells him Claire thinks John might hurt Jamie. She asks if he has seen the scars on her father's back. He shocks her by saying he did that to Jamie. John tells her about their relationship at the prison and Brianna thinks John flogged Jamie for not having sex with him. John is rightly affronted. He says Jamie did it to himself. You can't flog yourself. He started to reply, then snorted. He raised one brow at her, still angry, but with his feelings coming back under control. The hell you can't. You've been doing it for months, according to what you've told me. We aren't talking about me. Of course we are. No, we're not. She leaned toward him, heavy brows drawn down. What the hell do you mean he did it? The wind was blowing from behind her into his face. It made his eyes sting and water, and he looked away. What am I doing here? He muttered to himself. I must be mad to be talking with you in this manner. I don't care if you're mad or not, she said and gripped him by the sleeve. You tell me what happened. <laughs> he pressed his lips tight together, and for a moment she thought he wouldn't. But he had already said too much to stop, and he knew it. His shoulders rose under his cloak and dropped, slumping in surrender. We were friends then. He discovered my feelings for him. We were no longer friends by his choice. But that was not enough for him. He wished a final severance and so he deliberately brought about an occasion so drastic that it must alter our relation irrevocably and prevent any chance of friendship between us. So he lied. During the search of the prisoner's quarters, he claimed a piece of tartan publicly as his own. Possession was against the law then. It still is in Scotland. He drew a deep breath and let it out. He wouldn't look at her, but kept his eyes focused on the ragged fringe of bare trees across the river raw against the pale spring sky. I was the governor charged with the execution of the law. I was obliged to have him flogged, and he damn well knew I would be. He tilted his head back, resting it against the carved stone back of the bench. His eyes were closed against the wind. I could forgive his not wanting me, he said with quiet bitterness, but I couldn't forgive him for making me use him in that fashion not forcing me to merely hurt him, but to degrade him. He could not merely refuse to acknowledge my feelings. He must destroy it. It was too much. Bits of debris boiled past on the flood. Storm cracked twigs and branches, a broken board from the hull of a boat, wrecked somewhere upstream. Her hand covered his where it rested on his knee. It was slightly larger than his own, and warm from sheltering. In her cloak and warm from sheltering in her cloak. There was a reason. It wasn't you, but it's for him to tell you if he wants to. You did forgive him, though, she said quietly. Why? He sat up then and shrugged, but didn't put away her hand. I had to. He glanced at her eyes straight and level. 
I hated him for as long as I could, but then I realized that loving him, that was part of me, and one of the best parts. It didn't matter that he couldn't love me. That had nothing to do with it. But if I could not forgive him, then I could not love him, and that part of me was gone. And I found eventually that I wanted it back. He smiled faintly. So you see, it was really entirely selfish. Wow. Come, my dear, we shall both freeze solid if we sit here any longer. They walked back toward the house, not talking, but walking close together, arm in arm. As they came back through the gardens, he spoke abruptly. You're right, I think, to live with someone you love, knowing that they tolerate the relation only for the sake of obligation. No, I wouldn't do it either. Would only a matter of convenience and respect on both sides, then yes, such a marriage is one of honor. As long as both parties are honest. His mouth twisted briefly as he glanced in the direction of the servants' quarters. There is no shame. There is no need for shame on either side. He does not accept her proposal, but in front of watching eyes, he puts a ring on her finger and kisses her. They are engaged to buy time and get her aunt off her back. Oh, my goodness. I love Lord John to no end. I know. He's my gay book boyfriend. <laughs> I find him to be very similar to Jamie. And I find it tragic that in order to keep part of himself alive, in order to feel that he has to love someone who will never love him back the same way. That he's in a perpetual state of unrequited longing. I still think he uses it as a barrier because keeping that love alive, though it keeps him feeling, it keeps everything else out. And just because he may have sexual interludes... And just because he may have sexual interludes or brief relationships here and there, does he give himself the capability and the ability and the openness to love somebody else? Probably not. Probably not. So Jamie's a barrier. Even though the love for him allows John to be alive and to feel and to experience and not just be dead inside. It's definitely a brick wall as well that he puts up. And for him to have such a frank relationship, or I'm sorry, conversation with Brianna is shocking. But then you have to remember, he is used to Claire at this point, even though they haven't had excessive amounts of interaction. Remember, they shared that cabin when... He, he had the measles and she had to take care of him. So he had some very intimate space with Claire. There was no option, right? And in Voyager, when they met for the first time as Lord John, the governor of Jamaica, and not on the ship, right? When she realized who he was and all of that, they had that very frank discussion. He was just as catty as she was. So I don't think John is surprised at all by the frankness of Brianna <laughs> and by her just throwing it out there. People didn't really speak that way. They, like today, instead of telling you exactly what they mean, they'll layer it and they'll turn it and they'll almost make it into a game and you have to guess what the other person means. I think that's cruel to do to other people. I think it's, it's a form of lying because you're omitting what you really mean to say. Uh, I'm not like that. I can only say what I mean. <laughs> and part of that is because I don't tend to remember what I say verbatim because if I'm telling the truth, 
then I don't have to remember in detail what I said. You only have to remember what you said if you're lying. So it frees up my brain's hard drive to remember things that are really important. <laughs> so their frankness and openness is very normal to me. But I even have people tell me, like this year, I've had people tell me how blunt I am. I was like, oh, okay, I don't know how to be any different. So there you have it. <laughs> I'm sorry if it makes you uncomfortable, then I guess you don't talk to me. <laughs> but I am certain when someone asks me a question that I know has a difficult answer, that I will say, do you really want me to answer that? Do you want the nickel answer or the dollar answer? So I give them multiple outs along the way. So if they really don't want to hear what I have to say, I don't have to say it, but I'm not lying to them. I offered. And if they accept the challenge of listening, there you go. <laughs> I sort of feel like that's what happened to John here. He accepted the challenge of hearing Brianna out. She is in a state of desperation. She's trying to figure out how to make her position best for her and the baby, knowing that she's not going back, like she's here, at least for a while. And there's so many unknowns in her world that it's the best thing that she can do. And yes, I agree with John. If John had married Brianna and, you know, made a baby with her, yeah, Jamie would probably kill him. <laughs> There's not a place far enough that Lord John Gray could go not to be dead John Gray. So <laughs> there's so much in this chapter. It's not very long, but there's a lot. And I know I used a lot of the book excerpt because there was really no way for me to kind of boil that down into something smaller because there was so much richness in it. And this really gives us the foundation for another link to Lord John and that relationship. Because Brianna does not know about William. She doesn't know she has a brother. All she knows is that Lord John has a stepson that he's raising. So this relationship is pretty key and important and it's completely separate from her parents and that would be a little odd too like John left that part out but if he married Brianna and she got pregnant then their child would be William's half ugh how do we I don't even know okay what would that be so if his sister, because she'd be a stepmom, Lord John is a stepfather. So it would be her, his, I don't even know. I can't do the like genetic math on that at the moment. So the child would be his niece or nephew. Okay, now I got it. <laughs> that was difficult. And legal half-sibling. Or legal sibling. Okay, that's way too complicated. I can't go any further with that right now. <laughs> but there's so much here. And Brianna has so much at stake. And for Lord John to pretend to be engaged to her does let her off the hook. And does give her some time to devote energy to figuring out what else is going to happen. And it gives her time to wait to see if her mom and Jamie and young Ian and Roger return. So good on John. He's very loyal and protective. And even though he knows he can't marry her, he can pretend to be engaged to her in order to protect her position and her baby as well. Chapter 60, Trial by Fire. Roger and the priest were alone without food or fire. The waiting was tormenting. Finally, men came in the late afternoon. The sachem did not speak to Father Alexandre. He simply painted his face black from forehead to chin. The men left, and the priest sat on the floor. The priest asks Roger to pray for him that he might die well without crying out. 
After dark, they heard the drums. Roger could feel the beat in his bones. The Mohawk men returned for the priest. He went with them without a word or looking back, wearing only his bare skin. Roger stood in the tent, praying and listening. He knows what power a drum has. He was frightened. He sat without knowing for how long then the drumming stopped, and there was yelling. He made his way to the door, but the guard was still there. He stood frozen, listening to hellish noises and fighting. Something smashed into the panel of the tent and tore a hole in it. He only saw a small area of the clearing outside and figures fighting. Then he heard something terrifyingly familiar. Then he stiffened, pressing his face against the wood. Among the incomprehensible Mohawk yells, he could have sworn he had heard someone bellowing in Gaelic. He had. The shout was of Castle Dune, and it was followed by a raising, hair-raising screech. Scots, white men, he had to get to them. Roger smashed his fists on the shattered wood in a frenzy, trying to batter his way through the panel. By main force, the Gaelic voice broke loose again. No, wait. God, it was another voice, and the first one answering, Domi, Domi, to me, to me. And then a fresh wave of Mohawk shrieks rose up and drowned the voices. Women. It was women screaming now, their voices even louder than the men's. Roger was determined to get free into the Scots. He pulled apart the bed cubicle to make a weapon from the splintered wood. Roger charged out of the tent, narrowly missing, being hit by a war club. He was struck at the Mohawk, who smelled of whiskey. He turned toward the fire. He staggered, caught himself, then whirled toward the fire. It was an immense pyre, flames billowing in a wall of pure, ardent scarlet, vivid against the night. Through the bobbing heads of the watchers, he saw the black figure in the heart of the flame, arms spread in a gesture of benediction, lashed to the pole from which he hung. Long hair fluttered up, strands catching fire with a burst of flame, surrounding the head with a halo of gold, like Christ in a missile. Then something crashed down on Roger's head, and he dropped like a rock. He didn't quite lose consciousness. He couldn't see or move, but he could still hear, dimly. There were voices near him. The yelling was still there, but fainter, almost a background noise, like the roar of the ocean. He felt himself rise in the air, and the crackle of the flames got louder. It matched the roar in his ears. Christ, they were going to throw him into the fire— his head spun with effort and light blazed behind his shut lids, but his stubborn body wouldn't move. Roger was on the floor of the longhouse. They did not throw him in the fire. There was someone with him. He got onto his hands and knees and squinted to see who the other person was. Jesus Christ, he muttered to himself. He rubbed a hand hard over his face and blinked, but the man was still there six feet away. Jamie... Fraser. He was lying on his side in a huddle of limbs, a crimson plaid tangled around his body. Half his face was obscured with blood, but there wasn't any mistaking him. For a moment, Roger looked at him blankly. For months, the greater part of his waking moments had been devoted to imagining a meeting with this man. Now it had happened, and it seemed simply impossible. There was room for no feeling beyond a sort of dull amazement. He rubbed his face again, harder, forcing aside the fog of fear and adrenaline. What? What was Frieza doing here? When thought and feeling connected again, his first recognizable feeling was neither fury nor alarm, but an absurd burst of joyful relief. She didn't, he muttered, and the words sounded queer and hoarse to his ears after so long without spoken English. Oh, God, she didn't do it? Jamie Fraser could be here for only one reason, to rescue him. And if that was so, it was because Brianna had made her father come. Whether it was misunderstanding or malevolence that had put him through the hell of the last few months, it had not been hers. Didn't 
he said again. She didn't? He shuddered, both with nausea from the blow and with relief. He had thought he would be hollow forever, but suddenly there was something there, something small but very solid, something he could hold in the cup of his heart. Brianna. He had her back. There was another set of high-pitched screams from just outside. Ululations that went on and on, sticking into his flesh like a thousand pins. He jerked and shuddered again, all other feelings subsumed in renewed realization. Dying with the reassurance that Brianna loved him was better than dying without it. But he hadn't wanted to die in the first place. He remembered what he had seen outside, felt his gorge rise, and choked it down. With a trembling hand, he began the unfamiliar sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, he whispered, and then the words failed him. Please, please don't let him have been right. He crawled shakily to Fraser's body, hoping that the man was still alive. He was. Blood was flowing from a gash on Fraser's temple. And when he thrust his fingers under the man's jaw, he could feel the steady bump of a pulse. Jamie was alive. Roger cleaned his face with his plaid until Jamie woke up, vomited, and stared at Roger with hand on his knife. Blue eyes glared at him and Roger raised an arm in instinctive defense. Then Fraser blinked, shook his head, groaned, and sat down heavily on the earthen floor. Oh, it's you. He closed his eyes and groaned again, then his head snapped up, eyes blue and piercing, but this time with alarm rather than fury. Claire, he exclaimed, my wife, where is she? Roger felt his jaw drop. Claire, you brought her here? You brought a woman into this? Fraser gave him a glance of extreme dislike, but wasted no words. Palming the knife from his stocking, he glanced at the doorway. The flap was down, no one was visible. The noise outside had died down, though the rumble of voices was still audible. Now and then one stood out, shouting, or raised in exhortation. Jamie apologizes to Roger for doing him wrong. Fraser wiped a hand over his battered face and opened bloodshot eyes and looked at Roger. Wakefield, is it? I go by my own name these days, Mackenzie. Fraser gave a brief, humorless snort. So I've heard... He had a wide, expressive mouth, like Bree's. His lips compressed briefly, then relaxed. I've done you wrong to you, Mackenzie, as you'll know. I've come to put it right, so as far as may be. But it may be as I'll not have the chance, he gestured briefly toward the door. For now, you've my apology. For what satisfaction you may want of me later, I'll bide your will. But I'd ask you to let it wait until we're safe out of this. Roger stared at him for a moment. Satisfaction for the last months of torment and uncertainty seemed as far-fetched a notion as the thought of safety. He nodded. Done, he said. With a truce, Roger asks what happened. Jamie didn't know and was shocked to find out the burned man was a priest. Though white people were invited to the execution, they were not asked to leave either, so he and Claire stayed. Jamie explains to Roger what he saw and that he tried to get Claire away for fear of being attacked next. Father Alexandra had died well. Roger was having a hard time believing the priest was dead. Pushing the thoughts away, he asked Jamie how many men he brought with him. How many men did you bring with you? The blue eyes flashed, surprised. My nephew Ian. That's all? Roger tried to keep stunned disbelief out of his voice, but patently failed. "'You were expecting the 78th Heeland Regiment?' Fraser asked sarcastically. He got to his feet, swaying slightly, arm pressed to his side. "'I brought whiskey.' "'Whiskey?' "'Did that have anything to do with the fighting?' Remembering the reek of the man who had fallen over him, Roger nodded toward the wall of the longhouse. "'It may have.' <sighs> The Wicked Fire Drink. Roger gave Jamie water and sees how worried for Claire he is. 
Will you maybe ken a bit what happened there? I could guess. He acquainted Fraser with the priest's story, finding some small respite from the worry in the telling. They wouldn't have harmed her, he said, trying to reassure himself as much as Fraser. She had nothing to do with it. Fraser gave a derisory snort. Aye, she did. Without warning, he smashed a fist against the ground in a muffled thump of fury. Damn the woman! <laughs> She'll be all right, Roger repeated stubbornly. He couldn't bear to think otherwise, but he knew what Fraser plainly knew as well. If Claire Fraser was alive, unhurt and free, nothing could have kept her from her husband's side. And as for the unknown nephew? I heard your nephew in the fight. I heard him call out to you. He sounded all right. Even as he offered this bit of information, he knew how feeble it was as reassurance. Fraser nodded, though, head bent on his knees. He's a good lad, Ian, he murmured, and he has friends among the Mohawk. God send they will protect him. Roger's curiosity was coming back as the shock of the evening began to fade. Your wife? What did she do? How could she possibly have been involved in this? Fraser sighed. He scrubbed his good hand over his face and through his hair, rubbing until the loose red locks stood up in knots and snarls. I shouldn't have said so. It wasn't her fault, in the least. It's only... She'll not be killed, but God, if they've harmed her. They won't, Roger said firmly. What happened? Fraser shrugged and closed his eyes. Head tilted back, he described the scene as though he could still see it engraved on the inside of his eyelid. Perhaps he could. I did not take heed of the girl in such a crowd. I could not even say what she looked like. It was only at the last that I saw her. Claire had been by his side, white-faced and rigid, in the press of shouting, swaying bodies. When the Indians had nearly finished with the priest, they untied him from the stake and fastened his hands instead to a long pole, held above his head from which to suspend him in the flames. Fraser glanced at him, wiping the back of a hand across his lips. I've seen a man's heart pulled beating from his chest before, but I had not seen it eaten before his eyes. He spoke almost shyly, as though apologizing for his squeamishness. Shocked, he had looked to Claire. It was then that he had seen the Indian girl standing on Claire's other side with a cradleboard in her arms. With great calmness, the girl had handed the board to Claire, then turned and slipped through the crowd. She did not look to the left or right. She walked straight into the fire. What? Roger's throat closed with shock, the exclamation emerging in a strangled. Her clothes caught, and then her hair. By the time she reached him, she was burning like a torch. Still, he had seen the dark silhouette of her arms raised to embrace the empty body of the priest. Within moments, it was no longer possible to distinguish man or woman. There was only the one figure, black, amid the towering flames. It was then everything went mad. Fraser's wide shoulder slumped a little, and he touched the gash on his temple. All I can is one woman set up a howl, and then there was the hell of a screech, and of a sudden, everyone was either fleeing or fighting. Jamie pressed back against the longhouse, pushing Claire behind him. He was fighting, then woke up in the longhouse with Roger and no notion of where Claire was. Jamie's arm might be broken, by taking a hit from a war club. He hopes and believes Claire and young Ian are safe. If the boy were dead, he would rather have his heart torn out and eaten than face his sister. Jamie looks for distraction from his thoughts. Jamie watches Roger. Mackenzie was sitting hunched across the fire, heedless of the growing chill. His arms were wrapped about his knees, head bent in thought. He was half turned away, unaware of Jamie's eyes on him. He grudged to admit it, but the man was decently made. Long shanks and a good breadth through the shoulders. He'd have a fair reach with a sword. He was tall as the Mackenzies of Leoch, and why not, he thought suddenly. The man was Dougal's get, if a few generations onward. 
He found that notion both disturbing and oddly comforting. He'd killed men when he must, and mostly their ghosts let him sleep at night with no great rattling of bones. Dougal's death, though, was one that he had lived through more than once, and woke him from sweating, with the sound of those last silent words of Dougal's ringing in his ears, words mouthed in blood. There'd been not the slightest choice. It was kill or be killed, and a near thing either way. And yet, Dougal Mackenzie had been his foster father, and if he was honest, part of him had loved the man. Yes, it was some comfort to know that a small part of Dougal was left. The other part of this Mackenzie's heritage was a wee bit more troubling. He'd seen the man's eyes first thing when he woke, bright green and intent, and for one second his wame had shriveled up into a ball thinking of Galus Duncan. Did he much want his daughter linked with the witch's spawn? He eyed the man covertly. Perhaps it was as well if Brianna's child was not of this man's blood. Brianna, Mackenzie said, lifting his head suddenly from his knees. What is she? Jamie jerked and a hot knife seared his arm, leaving him sweating. Where? At River Run with her aunt. She's safe. His heart was thundering in his ears. Christ, was the man able to read thoughts or had he the sight? Roger wants to know why Claire came with him but not Brianna. Jamie tells him Claire refused to be left. Roger doubted Brianna would be any easier to leave behind. Something dark flickered in Mackenzie's eyes. Doubt or pain? I should not have thought Brianna the kind of last to mind her father's word over much, he said. His voice had an edge to it. Yes, pain and sort of jealousy. Jamie relaxed slightly, no mind reading. Did you know? Well, and perhaps you didn't ken her so well as all that, he said pleasantly enough, but with a jeering undertone that would make one sort of man go for his throat. Mackenzie wasn't that sort. He sat up straight and drew a deep breath. I know her well, he said levelly. She is my wife. Jamie sat up straight and turned and clenched his teeth in a hiss of pain. The hell she is! Mackenzie's black brows drew down at that. We'd her hand fast, she and I. Did she not tell you that? She hadn't. But he hadn't given her much chance to tell him either. Too furious at the thought of her willing to bet a man, stung at thinking she made a fool of him, proud as Lucifer and suffering the devil's pains for it, in wishing her perfect and finding her only human as himself. When? Jamie asked. Early September in Wilmington, when I, just before I left her, the admission came in willingly, and through the black veil of his own guilt he saw a reflection of it on Mackenzie's face. As well deserved as his own, he thought viciously, if the coward had not left her, she did not tell me. He saw the doubt and the pain in Mackenzie's eyes quite clearly now. The man worried that Brianna did not want him, for if she did, she would have come. He knew well enough that no power on earth or below it would keep Claire from his side if she thought him in danger, and felt a jolt of fear renewed at the thought, for where was she? I suppose she thought she wouldn't see Hanfaston as a legal form of marriage, Mackenzie said quietly. Or perhaps she did not see it so herself, Jamie suggested cruelly. He could relieve the man's mind by telling him a part of the truth that Brianna had not come because she was with child— but he was in no charitable mood. It was getting quite dark, but even so he could see Mackenzie's face flush at that, and his hands clench on the ragged deerskin. I saw it so, was all he said. Jamie closed his eyes and said no more. The last coals in the fire died slowly, leaving them in darkness. Whoa! So the priest was executed. The woman who loved him and had his baby... Gave Claire the baby and followed her into the flames. Awesome. Followed him into the flames, I mean to say. Roger killed a man. All hell broke loose. Roger and Jamie ended up in the same longhouse. In-law relations are not getting off to a good start. <laughs> Jamie is deathly worried about Claire and young Ian, but mostly Claire. But mostly Claire. 
And it's interesting that he's begrudging Roger. Like, Roger can't help that Galus is his ancestor, just like he can't help that it's Dougal, right? We don't choose that. And what is it in Jamie? What's the rest of it that's holding back from Roger? I mean, he apologized. Roger forgave him. They have a truce. He says Roger can have Adam later once they're safe and out of here. And it does give Roger a bit of peace knowing that it wasn't Brianna who had sent Jamie, you know, to beat the crap out of him and nearly kill him and send him away, right? But then why hadn't she told them that they were hand fast? Was it because at this point it didn't matter? Was it because there wasn't time? Because Jamie wouldn't hear it? Because Brianna didn't want Roger to marry her out of obligation? One thing I really liked in this chapter well, and the prior chapter, all the natural descriptions that really f- mirrored back what was going on with the characters. There's a lot of that. And with Lord John and Brianna outside and in that bitter cold and they were suffering during their conversation, that was a very difficult conversation to be having. So their internal suffering was really playing out in the external of the weather as well. And in this chapter, particularly, when the point of view shifted from Roger to Jamie, it just kind of moved. And all of a sudden, we were in Jamie's head (laughs) and looking at Roger, and he was thinking about Claire, and we could see his processes. Because prior, we had really been in Roger's head. We'd never been in the priest's head. While we were at this village, we were either seeing it from Jamie's vantage point or Claire's vantage point or Roger, right? So I liked how that shifted. It takes like a moment to get your brain to go, oh, yes, this is what's going on. So we're down to it. We got to figure it out. Remember, Roger's injured, probably has a concussion now. So does Jamie, but Roger's got that injured foot that needs to be attended to. Where the heck is Claire? What happened to the kid, the baby? Uh, So next week we're doing chapter 61 and 62. Oh boy, that is going to be a lot of fun. So the reason I called this one, what I did fighting words. It's because the things that Brianna said to Lord John were absolutely fighting words. Some of the things that John disclosed to her, those were fighting words. Absolutely. What Roger is saying to Jamie and vice versa is fighting words. So this whole thing was about that. Wow. And there's a little bit of a almost cruel streak in Jamie toward Roger. It's like, Is it because he feels guilty? Is it because he doesn't feel guilty? Is it because of jealousy? Is it because of Roger's ancestry? I mean, there's a lot going on. We don't know. I hope I never get to see an execution like that. I don't want to ever see somebody drawn and quartered, their heart pulled out, all of that jazz, right? (laughs) Just as bad. Uh, but to have your heart pulled out and eaten in front of you, that's uh, that's insult to injury, if you're asking me. <laughs> okay, so I want to hear your feedback. Contact at adramaoutlander.com or 719-425-9444. And since most of us have free long distance, at least in the United States, leave a voicemail message for me. That would be fantastic. So I'm going to finish reading Meredith's email from last week because it spanned across chapters 58 and 59. So now I can now I can read it. I don't like Brianna's scheme of blackmail to get what she wants. It's definitely a new low. It's even worse that she's doing it to make Roger leave her. I mean, what if John had actually accepted the offer and they were married by the time Roger came back? He comes back after being beaten up by her father and being held prisoner by the Indians. 
and his girlfriend has forsaken him for another man she hardly knows, and he'd have no way of knowing that John Gray isn't interested in Brianna in the least, not unless Claire or Jamie told him. And I doubt Roger would stick around long enough for explanations anyway. So thank goodness John doesn't give in. The first time I read it, I was thinking that John would go ahead and tell her of the fact that she's offering to mother her little brother. I do love his generosity in offering to pretend to be her fiancé until further notice. It's almost as though being unable to have Jamie in the way he'd like, he keeps finding other ways to be a member of the Fraser family. Absolutely he does. You and I both know what branch he occupies next in the saga. Enough said, all I can say is that I appreciate Lord John for his complete determination to be indispensable to Jamie Fraser's family. Sincerely, Meredith of Everett, Washington. I just think it's desperation on Brianna's part and immaturity. Like, she would just pull it, hoping to get what she wanted out of him. But she wouldn't have gone through with it. We know that. Ah, Yes. I'm glad they found a way through it. And then Meredith sent an email this week. I'm sorry for jumping the gun in the chapters. Meredith, it's fine. <laughs> I was just, just read it this week. I would love it if you included the other part in your next podcast. Done. I'd like to add one more thing, if you wouldn't mind. I really don't like hearing in Jamie's private thoughts that he doesn't like Roger because he's related to Galus Duncan. He's like six generations onward. I especially don't like hearing that it would be better if Roger wasn't the father of Bree's baby. Seriously, Jamie? You'd prefer that the father is a rapist? What is the matter with you? Yes, I agree with you, Meredith. I also don't like Jamie not telling Roger why he did what he did. It's like he's sabotaging things. If Roger didn't think that time travel was a prison before, I guarantee he was having a few second thoughts because of Jamie. Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> I don't exactly know what's compelling Jamie. So if you have any more thoughts, please share them. I don't think he really wants the child to be fathered by Stephen Bonnet. I think that's worse. But remember, Galus tortured Ian, young Ian, and raped him and all those things. Took him away with the gems, and they had to go on that massive adventure to get him back. And he has no love for Galus. He knows what she's capable of. Hello! I've been listening to Drums of Autumn and podcasts for show episodes of Season 3 Voyager. I remember you saying that you wanted some notable sections to use as examples. I'm not sure exactly what you were looking for. I came across this section and I couldn't stop laughing. It is from Episode 111, Heaven and Earth. Time of Section 955 to 1110. When Jamie is being so crabby and trying to make a bargain with Fergus to help him get out of jail. It was all funny, but when you said... Jamie, just stop, go back in the corner, and throw up in your bucket. I just lost it. You say you're not funny. You are very funny, especially in this section. This was a hard episode for me to get through with all the throwing up. <laughs> like you, I really enjoyed Pound and Goat Lady. Annika. Oh, we miss Annika. They helped me get through it when I watched it. I love that the people who make this show are so authentic. Six scenes, I could use a little less. You usually don't say anything about what has changed from the book when you are doing the podcast for the show, but I thought it was funny that you kept saying, book readers are expecting someone for Claire to meet, and you're mistaken again. Spoiler alert! <laughs> it's true. I try to keep them as separate as possible, but when there are some very pivotal things that are different, it's stunningly shocking to readers. Still, even if we do a good job of keeping them and completely separate spheres. I was not a happy woman when they didn't include the scene with Lord Grey and Claire. I'm not as fond of Lord Grey as you are, but I like that scene in the book. I really like the guy who was playing Lord Grey in season three. David Barry is phenomenal. I really wish they could have somehow included Goat Lady throwing Jamie overboard to go after Claire. I loved that in the book. 
Another good idea for a novella read, I think, would be Virgins. I think it'd be really cool to read about Ian and Jamie in early years that we always hear about, but not in detail in other books. Keep up the good work. I appreciate everything you do. Caroline or Carolyn, Louisville, Kentucky. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm glad you think that I was funny in that. Oh, yes. He just needed to stop. Uh, it's funny because I don't, once I edit an episode, I don't go back and listen. So I'm going to have to go back and listen to that piece and pull it out and post it. Thank you for that. That's exactly what I meant. So if you're listening to one of the podcasts, any of you listeners, and there's a section that you particularly like, let me know what the timestamp is when it starts and where it ends and which podcast. And I can clip it out because I have all the podcasts on my tablet and then I can just post it by itself. <laughs> I'm glad you appreciate it. It's crazy. So we're winding down, have another handful of episodes left before we move on to novella. And I just really do want your feedback. Please email me, leave a voicemail message, leave comments, Come over to Facebook and join the group, which is a drama of Outlander. You have to answer some questions. Got to make sure you're a real person and you're an Outlander fan. Also go and like the page, a drama of Outlander. The difference is on the group, you get to talk, you get to post and everybody will see it. On the page, I drive the content or my awesome administrators do. You know, go over to Twitter and Instagram. It's Dram of Outlander. I try and procure things and put them up there. And the help I need with the intro. I'm going to be finding some new music that is Creative Commons, or I can just make some myself. Uh, Gina had an interesting idea about making it more with the Dram side of things. And maybe the pouring of a Dram. So I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing with that. But what I really need some help with is the written copy for the opening. I changed it up a little this week. You probably noticed. But I'm trying to find a way to have a new opening of what I'm saying. And since I've been saying the other opening for so long now, for so many episodes, it's a challenge for me to think of something fresh and new. So that's what I need your help with. The other way that you can help please go through Apple Podcasts and iTunes and give me a rating. Every five-star rating helps drive people to me. The podcast is continuing to grow, but I'm the only solo one out there, so I could use your help for sure. Share the podcast, share the Facebook page, invite people to the group, you know, talk to each other, talk to me. I love hearing from you and I love interacting because I'm sitting in my recording box by myself, talking to myself. <laughs> so I do this for you. I mean, I would reread these books and do my own commentary on them in my own head, whether I was doing the podcast or not. But I love doing this so much. And be on the lookout for another podcast or two that I'll be launching soon. Not about this. <laughs> something totally different, but I hope you'll like join me over there too when it happens. And lastly, the way that you can help is by financial support. You can go to patreon.com slash a dram of outlander and pledge a monthly amount. Every dollar counts. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. The website, the equipment, everything requires upkeep. And again, it's just me. Thankful I have a very supportive spouse that this is my, <laughs> this is my main outlet outside of hiking and reading. So it keeps me off the streets and he knows where I'm at. <laughs> it's a very safe extracurricular activity to be doing. The other way that you can financially support is if you want to send a one-time offering, just shoot me an email or leave me a voicemail and I'll tell you how to do that. So I appreciate you to no end, and I look forward to hearing some of your thoughts and getting questions, and yes, I want your input. And how much do you love John Gray? Like, I love him 
like out of 10, I love him like 10 out of 10. The more I've gotten to know him and after going and doing the Scottish Prisoner last year as a read-along, after I finished Voyager, that just cinched it for me. I mean, he's amazing. He really is. But he's the second son. So, you know, his life is a lot different than Hal's life, right? So he's had to make this path. But he's so brave and he's loyal and he's honest and he's protective and he's all these amazing, wonderful things. And he's smart and he's funny as can be. So, yes, he's my gay book boyfriend. Like, Jamie's not my boyfriend. Like, he's Claire's. I've never considered him anything like that. But Lord John, yeah, he's totally would be mine. Love him to beans. Just to death. All right. I'm going to stop talking now. And I hope you have a fantastic week. And until next time, slan java.